Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. We are on the road coming to you from Focus Hopes Campus in Detroit, and we're tackling a subject that has permeated the nation's headlines recently. We'll explore attitudes toward race and what they say about Detroit and our region. Focus Hope was founded after the 1967 Detroit Rebellion to help overcome racism, poverty, and injustice in the city. We're here today as an example of our vision for One Detroit, where we connect you with stories of Detroit's past, present, and future. Our commitment includes examining the most important issues from Detroit outward. One of those issues is the killings of black men by white police officers in cities across the country. This escalation of lethal force has raised numerous questions, such as whether police have an implicit bias toward black men. My first guest is a nationally recognized expert on neuroscience, decision making, and the law. She lectures to police officers, prosecutors, public defenders, and judges throughout the United States. Please welcome Kimberly Papillon to American Black Journal. Thank you. So it's just coincidence that we're doing this show tonight, but earlier today, of course, we saw uh, the prosecutor in Baltimore dismiss all of the charges against the officers who were involved in the arrest of uh, a guy named Freddie Gray who was uh, detained and then mysteriously, I suppose, turns up with a broken back. Uh, now they're saying no one is essentially responsible for that. And that's the kind of disconnect, I think, uh, that really raises these questions about bias and implicit bias and how we see the value of people's lives based on their skin color. Your research uh, tells us a lot about how that works. In the area in which I teach, which is based on the research of so many um, scientists across the nation and the world, um, I think gives us insight into this area. Um, the uh, most telling components are those studies on a part of the brain called the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is the part of the brain that lights up if on the scans if you see a spider or a snake. Fear. And Big pardon? Fear. It fear. The fear, fear. Uh, threat, anxiety, distrust components of the conversation come into uh, stark relief when we start talking about the amygdala. Now, what they began to do was flash pictures of African American men's faces and Caucasian men's faces and see where people were getting the higher level of amygdala activation. And they found that they were getting a higher level of that spider snake like activation when people were looking at the African American men's faces. Now, to be clear, this is a U.S. phenomenon. This isn't natural behavior, this is learned behavior. Because when we go to other countries, we don't see the same reaction. And this then changes into a number of different phenomena that actually make us very frightened about the future for our country. Um, for instance, that, that same notion of I get a higher level of amygdala activation or somebody might get a higher level of amygdala activation based on their level of implicit or unconscious bias. Um, then translates into higher levels as people are looking at individuals with higher levels of Afrocentric facial features. So on a scale of one to nine, um, nine being most Afrocentric, one being least Afrocentric, President Obama might be a three. Um, Shaquille O'Neal might be an eight or a nine. Right. On this scale, and only this scale, Denzel Washington would be a five because on any other scale he would be a ten. I think we have <laughs> agreement about that, certainly. I think um, black and white people that would Across agree the on board, that, there's right. unanimity on that. Um, <laughs> but, but that notwithstanding, what difference does that make when judges begin to make decisions? Right. So on that scale of one to nine, as the level of Afrocentricity increases, same crime, same additional offenses, same criminal history, all of those things being equal, you're getting seven to eight more months at every step along the scale of one to nine, meaning that the person at a nine is getting years more than their counterpart of three for the same crimes. Right, right. 400 days more when you just look at skin color, um, for the Shaquille O'Neal's versus their Caucasian counterparts, 200 more days for the Denzel's versus their Caucasian counterparts. Yeah. That's significant. Yeah, and, and one of the questions that comes up is where is the point of interdiction? How do we sort of start to say, all right, we're gonna uh, sort of uh, reset the scale, uh, this zero to nine scale, and try to make it uh, a zero to zero scale, right? So that uh, the, 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 the lightest uh, skin colored person with the least Afrocentric uh, features is treated the same as someone who looks like Shaquille O'Neal or, or who looks like me. Your work is in trying to get people to that space. Uh, where do you see the opportunity? The first step in any 12-step program is admit you have a problem. So we have to start there. Which is one of the big problems in America, right? But uh, there's a denial that's based on I, I don't see color, I don't see race, I don't engage in unfair behavior. Um, but if we are wired somehow, not from birth, but 
from a very young age taught over and over again that this is this is how uh, we should perceive people. It's hard to undo that if we don't at least first admit we have a problem. That yeah. step is necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. And to help to get to that space, we have to look at the fact that we have tests out there that show here's an African-American man holding a wallet or a cell phone and another picture of him holding a gun. Same with a Caucasian man, wallet, cell phone or gun. Say shoot if you see a gun. Say no shoot if you see a wallet or a cell phone right there on the computer screen. If you see a tool versus if you see a weapon. These are easy tests and we find that people are more likely to say shoot for the African-American man holding the wallet or the cell phone than they are for the Caucasian man holding the gun. Wow. on the test. Wow. So this is not simply a phenomenon we can say it's just a few bad apples let's set it to the side. Yeah. This is a larger problem that's both deep and wide right. and we need to deal with uh, it. You've also taken a look at age, uh, the way people respond to children of uh, different ethnic backgrounds uh, based on their behavior. Uh, tell us what that, what that shows us. This threat response links to the notion of how we see people as being culpable, responsible, um, and ex indeed dangerous. So if I give you three pictures of children all looking like they're 10 years old, and there are things that make a face look 10 and make a face look 40. Mm -hmm. So um, three 10 year old boys, and the only things I change on those faces are the things that make one appear to be Latino, one to be African American, and one to be Caucasian. And then I tell you the story of a child engaging in a felony behavior, felony type behavior. What they find is that the child that was previously seen as 10, when, the Caucasian child who was previously seen as 10, will now be seen as nine by the police officers who were tested. The African American child who should have been seen as 10 will be seen as 14, and the Latino child seen as 12. Now flash a picture of an ape in front of these same respondents. Right. Now the African American child is seen as 15 or 16, the Caucasian child seen as seven and a half. Which, which again goes to this idea of threat and fear that you think an older child is more likely to be uh, a danger to you. And the idea of imagery, ape has nothing to do with one race or the other. Right. That's just right. something that's out there in the ether that people don't want to talk about. Yeah. Well, if we don't talk about the fact that that image and certain words like savage, urban jungle, wilding also create that increased threat reaction, then we can't fully understand why Tamir Rice can be in a park playing with a toy gun and people don't see a child, they right. see an adult with a real gun. Right. And not just people, but individuals with this um, unconscious bias that we aren't able or willing to talk about. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you to tell me about one thing you see in the work that you're doing or in the research that gives you hope. Um, if we can start, one thing that, I'm doing, that I see that's out there um, is the gathering of information. That's critical to the analysis as well We're as training. We're starting to do that. We think that the crime rate is the arrest rate. And so the reason that African American men are getting shot at 40% unarmed black men are 40% of the people who are sh shot and killed by police when they're 9% of the population. We think that's the crime rate. But if we look at the number of people who use marijuana, percentage right. of Caucasian people who use marijuana versus the percentage of people in the African American uh, community who use marijuana, there's higher by 10% in each year for the past 10 oh, years. Yeah. Of, Afri of Caucasian people who use marijuana. But if we look at the arrest rate, it's a different story. Right. The arrest rate is night and day. And people say, we're looking at the crime rate, that's why more people are getting shot. No, you're looking at the arrest rate, which says where the bias is and who's getting patrolled and protected in their right. neighborhoods and communities versus who's actually engaging in activity. And that's where we need to sort of start the conversation with that data to get to a space where that's no longer a problem. Uh, thank you very much thank you. Uh, for being here.